Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the TED Colloquium. And uh, today we are very happy to have Oya Mandel Stam um, as the speaker. So Oya is the new faculty member joining in the department this year, I think. Um, she works in enumeration and algebraic combinatorics. Um, before joining to the department, she uh, was, uh, she graduated from UC Berkeley and also worked as, as postdoc in um, Bronx University for a while. So today she's going to talk about McDonald polynomials. So take it away, Oya. Uh, thank you, uh, Jane, for uh, inviting me to give a, a colloquium talk. And also thank you all for coming in the middle of your summer. So, um, so, my, so my recent uh, focus has been at the intersection of uh, interacting particle systems and algebraic combinatorics. And uh, specifically, I've been focusing on combinatorial objects uh, uh, that, that can, um, that, that describe the connections between McDonald polynomials and various particle processes. So uh, in this talk, I'll, I'll uh, describe some of our recent discoveries uh, with um, Arvind Iyer, uh, who's uh, in India, and James Martin, who's at Oxford. So uh, here's how I'll structure my talk. So I'll start with uh, the background and the motivation. And then I will uh, describe the, our new combinatorial formula. Uh, and then I will define a, uh, a, a new particle model. Uh, it's, it's not entirely new, but the, but the interest in it has, has become new. Um, and finally, I will uh, define an enriched Markov chain on the combinatorial objects that projects to the particle model. So uh, I apologize for my first few slides. Uh, they're just full of uh, these definitions. I promise that the rest of my slides uh, are a lot more uh, engaging. So uh, just a review of symmetric functions. So X is going to be our family of commuting variables and lambda is the ring of symmetric functions in these variables. So we say that a function is symmetric if it's invariant under permutation of its variables. And uh, so we index the bases for lambda by partitions. Uh, and so there are several natural bases. Uh, so there's the monomial uh, symmetric functions, the elementary, homogeneous, and power sum symmetric functions. And uh, finally, there's uh, what many would consider the most important basis is uh, the Scher functions. So uh, one, one reason that they, they are the, a, a very important basis is that they can be defined as the unique family uh, of polynomials that are orthogonal uh, with respect to the standard inner product uh, or symmetric functions. Uh, they're, they're also upper triangular with respect to the monomial basis. And so, so the Scher functions play a very important role in, in many aspects of uh, algebraic combinatorics. So now let's uh, define a, uh, another family of polynomials. So, so let's add the parameters Q and T to the ring of symmetric functions. So now lambda uh, has these additional parameters. And so uh, we define the standard inner product uh, in, in this way. So it's defined uh, in terms of the power sum uh, basis. And uh, now we define McDonald polynomials in an analogous way to how one can describe the Scher functions. So, uh, so, so we can define these polynomials uh, as the uh, unique family that is uh, upper triangular with respect to the monomial basis. 
and it's also orthogonal with respect to the, this, uh, this inner product. Um, and these are called McDonald's triangularity and normalization axioms. So, so these polynomials were uh, introduced by McDonald in, in 88. And, and since then they have uh, uh, received a huge amount of attention in, in many areas of math not just combinatorics. Um, so, oh, here, here's an example of, of one of these polynomials. So, so, so they have uh, very important connections to algebraic geometry representation theory um, and, and other, many other fields. And uh, in, so, so in particular, uh, studying the combinatorics of them has, has allowed us to solve many outstanding problems in these other areas. So that's, so that's one of the reasons why they uh, attract so much attention. So, so these polynomials simultaneously generalize uh, many well-studied families. Uh, so the Schur functions, when we set Q equal to T, the Hall Littlewood polynomials uh, at Q equals zero, and the Jack polynomials um, as well. And uh, so, furthermore, so the polynomials I've defined are for uh, the type A root system, uh, but the definition can be extended for, for other root systems. And in particular, McDonald polynomials of type BC are. Uh, um, are known as the Kornwinder polynomials. And setting the Kornwinder polynomials to uh, just one variable, we get the ASCII-Wilson polynomials. And those, in turn, uh, generalize most of the classical families of orthogonal polynomials in one variable. So they are at the top of that hierarchy. So, uh, so as you saw before, when I showed the example of a P lambda, so it, it doesn't look very combinatorial. So, so it has, uh, so the P lambda has, has rational coefficients that are, are not, uh, not positive, not positive. So the modified McDonald polynomials uh, are another version of the McDonald polynomials. So we denote them by H tilde. And we can consider them to be a combinatorial form of the P lambdas. So, uh, and combinatorial form in the sense that uh, their coefficients are, are nice positive integers. So they were defined by Garcia and Heyman in 96. And uh, so they define them through a uh, plethistic substitution from a normalized form of uh, the P lambda. So, so in this formula here, J lambda is just P lambda with, um, so, so it's just P lambda with uh, clear denominators more or less. And then this bracket notation means that uh, the variables X were, are substituted uh, by some, some other set of variables. And so, so there, are, there are many uh, very beautiful, incredible properties of these polynomials. So uh, the simplest properties are that they were uh, conjectured to have non-negative integer coefficients. Uh, and also, they were conjectured to expand positively in the shear functions. So this was not easy to prove, uh, this positivity. So this was proved using some very advanced geometric techniques by, by Mark Heyman. Uh, and uh, there's still many, uh, many open problems uh, to find combinatorial interpretations for. Uh, for, for, for some of these, uh, yeah, for, for the positivity of these polynomials. Okay, so 
So combinatorial formulas for uh, the modified McDonald have been, um, were discovered by Hagelin, Hay, and Lur uh, in, in 2004. So, so they uh, came up with these statistics, MAJ and INF, and in terms of these statistics, they, they gave Tableau formulas for uh, both the P lambda and uh, the modified McDonald. And so uh, I, I will I describe those formulas um, uh, a little bit later. So, uh, so to, to get into some of the motivation for this current work, so uh, recently with Cortell and Williams, we found a new combinatorial formula for P lambda in terms of uh, an object that comes from probability theory called the multi-line cues. And th those were discovered by Ferrari and Martin in 2007 to describe stationary probabilities of uh, the ASAP, which is a, um, a, a famous particle model in statistical mechanics. And since this discovery of of, of, the, of the combinatorial link from the P lambdas uh, to the tableau. Uh, this has inspired uh, more, more work in a similar vein. So, so with Cortell, Haglin, Mason, and Williams, we found a formula for you now the modified version of McDonald using the same statistic match and inf and also conjectured another formula using a new statistic quinv, uh, where the statistic quinv is actually inspired by uh, the multi-line, the formula with the multi-line cues. So, um, so, so that, so that's uh, that part of the story. Uh, and and just in in passing, I'll mention that. Uh, Another formula for the modified McDonald was found in terms of colored paths using uh, integrability by Garbali and Wheeler. So uh, now that I've given the definitions, I can uh, summarize our, our motivations here. So we have these three major areas. So we have uh, statistical mechanics and probability. We have uh, orthogonal polynomials and we have combinatorial objects, uh, which, uh, which describe both the probability parts and the orthogonal polynomials. And so what we had before was this, uh, this beautiful connection between the ASAP, the P lambdas, and these multi-line cues. And inspired by uh, multi-line cues, uh, we came up with this new formula in terms of, in terms of a statistic quin for the modified McDonald. And so our question was, is there an analogous uh, interacting particle system that can, that can fill in this space? So uh, such that we can describe its probabilities using this new, new formula and uh, we, we, can, we can derive uh, certain quantities as specializations of the modified McDonald. Um, and so uh, I guess I've already spoiled the, the mystery of, of the slide. So, so yes, we did find such a, a process. Uh, we discovered that the, um, the totally asymmetric zero range process uh, is, is the particle system that we are looking for. Here, so I so the second half of my talk will be focused on on that. Okay, so so now uh, I will describe these tableau formulas. So we'll start with a partition, and then uh, from that partition we define a diagram. So we denote it by dg of lambda. So this consists of K bottom justified columns where each column has lambda I boxes from left to right. So 
this is uh, neither the French notation or the English notation um, for, for, for Young diagrams and or it's not the Russian notation either. So um, my my co-authors uh, decided to call it the American notation. So a tableau of type lambda n is a a filling, so an arbitrary filling of the cells of uh, the diagram with the integers one through n. And each tableau gives a monomial weight. So we just associate each entry i to an xi. So, so here in this filling, we have three ones. So we have x1 cubed. We have two twos, x2 squared, and so on. Uh, and then a descent in a tableau is a cell whose content is greater than the content of the cell directly below. So I've highlighted all of the descents here. Um, the leg of a cell is the number of cells uh, above in the same column. So for example, the leg of this three here is equal to two and the leg of this four is equal to zero. Uh, and now the major index of this filling is the sum over uh, leg plus one of all of the descents. So in this case, we have, uh, we have the major index is six. Okay, so, so now uh, the next statistic has to do with triples of cells. So a gamma, uh, gamma triple is a uh, triple in this configuration. So you have two adjacent cells in the same column and a third cell that is uh, to the right in the same row as the one above. Um, and we can also have degenerate triples. So if the cell Y does not exist, uh, meaning that X and Z are, are in the bottom row, then we call that a degenerate triple. And such a triple forms an inversion if the entries increase cyclically when read counterclockwise. So we would read them x, y, z, or z, x, y, or y, z, x. Uh, and so we break ties by a, a reading order uh, that's given by uh, reading the rows from top to bottom and from left to right within each row. So uh, inv denotes the total number of inversions. And in this filling, we actually only have one, uh, one inversion. So, so this triple of cells two, three, four is an inversion. Okay. So now the celebrated formula of Heglin, Hing, and Lur uh, states that we can compute the modified McDonald polynomial by taking the sum over all of the fillings of uh, the diagram of lambda, q to the match, t to the nth. So, so here's a small example when lambda is 2, 1. So the shape of our filling is this Young diagram with these two columns. Uh, and so the so I split it up by, by monomials. So if we have three ones, then the, there's a unique filling with three ones. Um, and then if we have two ones and one two, then we have a total of three fillings and they have weights one, T and Q and Q and T. And so if we add up all of these weights uh, over all these fillings, then we get the, uh, the McDonald polynomial corresponding to the partition two one. Okay, so now let me define a new statistic called a Q inversion. So I will explain uh, where the word Q comes from. Um, so now instead of the gamma triple that we have before, we have an L triple because it's in the shape of an L. So uh, it has this configuration where now the third cell is 
uh, in the same row as the, the one on the bottom. And we can also have degenerate L triples when the cell X does not exist. So for example, uh, if Y is two and Z is four, then that would be, that would constitute a degenerate triple. And uh, an L triple forms a Q inversion, which we denote by quint. If the entries increase cyclically when read counterclockwise, like before, so we read them uh, cyclically in order X, Y, Z. And, and now we break ties also with the reading order, but the reading order changes. So the reading order is now right to left instead of left to right. And quinv is the total number of Q inversions. So, uh, so here I, I show all of them. So, the, so here's a third one. And then this is a degenerate uh, Q inversion. And I believe that's it. So we have a total of four, four quinvs. Um, for this filling. So this is actually the same filling that I showed uh, before. So with the statistic in, there was just one in and there's four quims. Okay, and so our new formula is, is, very, is very simple. So we just, uh, so it, it, lo it looks very similar to Hagelin, Hammond, Lerner's formula, except that we replace the inv uh, with a quinv in this uh, in the exponent of the t. So here's a uh, here's another example. Um, so yeah, so so these are the statistics uh, with the quinv. Uh, so if we had used the in statistics, we would get the same total, but each of these individual fillings would have a different weight from, from what you see here. So what is interesting about uh, this, this formula is that the statistics in Vinquin appear uh, very, very similar. So, so one would think that there should be an easy way to go from one to the other, um, but unfortunately that doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, we, we, don't, we don't think there's a simple bijective proof of this result, uh, but it would be really nice to find some, some bijection to translate between these statistics. So actually our, our proof for this formula uh, was, was quite technical. It was a lot more difficult than uh, the proof for uh, Hagelin, Him, and Lerr's formula, in fact, um, even though, so we, so we use the, we use the same proof strategy, but uh, we had to do a lot more work. Okay, so, so now why are these called Q inversions? So here I'll explain the connection to, uh, to, to, to Qs and to queuing systems. So the tableau that I was showing you are actually representing a queuing system. So a queuing system is an arrangement of, of lattice paths. So you can think of, um, so if we just look at two rows of a queuing system, we can think of the top row as uh, being the set of customers and the bottom row is a set of services. And then each cost, so the customers have different priorities. So here we say the, the larger uh, labels of the particles have priority over the smaller labels. And they, so in turn, they're going to go down to the row below and pick an available service. Um, and so, and so in, in this diagram, they, uh, they pick an available service by moving uh, to the left cyclically since um, we're, on a, we're on a cylinder. And so uh, so, there, so there's a very, a very uh, nice way to go from a tableau to uh, an arrangement of lattice paths. So each column of the filling 
is going to correspond to a string of particles. And I've color coded them so that uh, the, the green string, the, the green column corresponds to the green string and the blue is the blue and so on. So, uh, so here's how we translate. So uh, the content of the cell tells us the X coordinate of the corresponding particle uh, on the lattice. So, so here, if we read green from top to bottom, uh, the content is two, two, one, three, two. So that means that we start uh, at location two, then we go down to location two, and then we go to location one, and then we wrap around to location three, and we end at location two. And so similarly for the blue, uh, 2142 is the, is the column. So we start at two, go to one, go to four, and then go to two. And so, so, all, so all of this ties back to these multi-line cues that I was talking about before. So recall that I said that the p the p lambdas so the so the usual McDonald polynomials uh, they have a correspondence with the ASEP, uh, which is a certain particle model, and the ASEP uh, we can compute its probabilities using these multi-line cues, and so now we can get the modified McDonald polynomials by uh, applying plethysm to the p lambdas. And these tableau are, can be considered a plethistic version of the tableau that are used to, uh, to compute the p lambdas. Um, and similarly, so these, uh, these multi-line diagrams, uh, we can think of them as a plethistic version of multi-line cues. So specifically, what this means is notice that each location on this lattice is allowed to have more than one particle. So in a multi-line queue, uh, this would not be allowed. So in a multi-line queue, each location can have maximum one particle. And uh, the plethistic version allows us to remove that restriction. And so, 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 that's, so that's the connection here. Uh, okay, and so, so our statistics uh, will also translate very nicely to uh, statistics on the queue. So in particular, so when a customer is choosing a service, if a customer refuses an available service, we call that a refusal. And so each refusal corresponds to a Q inversion. So here I highlighted one of the Q inversions in the filling. Uh, and so this, this corresponds to this orange, uh, this orange customer uh, who ends up choosing this particle in location four. But on, its, on his path, uh, the orange customer passes this red service and refuses that service and continues onward. So, so that refusal corresponds to this Q inversion. Um, by the way, the reason that these uh, blue and green particles are not considered refusals is that um, the, the blue and the green have priority over the orange. And so they are no longer available by the time the orange is making its choice. And so we have one more uh, Q inversion, uh, one more quint in, in the filling. So this corresponds to uh, this green particle matching with this green particle here in column three. Uh, and so the green has priority over the blue. So as the green uh, moves along the row, the green passes by this blue particle uh, and, ref and refuses that service. And so, so that corresponds to this, this triple. Okay. So uh, yeah, so, so all of this, all of this was foreshadowing for uh, 
the, the connection to the interacting particle model that we are going to relate to these tableau. So, so the model that we have discovered uh, to the tableau is called the totally asymmetric zero range process uh, or TASERP. So, um, so, so this model has been has been studied before. We we did not come up with it, uh, but there there hasn't been very much interest in this particular one that I will describe right now. So this is a continuous time stochastic process that was uh, defined by Spitzer in 1970. So it can be defined on arbitrary graphs, but in our case, uh, we just consider a circular lattice with n sites. So, so here we have five sites in our lattice, so n is five. And so in the simplest case, uh, we just have k indistinguishable particles that are moving counterclockwise on this lattice. So here we have a total of uh, seven particles, so k is seven. And a configuration or a state of this uh, process is any allocation of the k particles on the n sites. And we represent this by, um, by a, a weak composition tau uh, with, with n parts. Um, and so here, I'm just going to chop this circle at some designated location. So I'll chop it here, and then I'll read, uh, I'll read off the numbers of particles uh, clockwise. Uh, so here we have two, zero, three, one, one. So that's our state. And uh, so, so let's, so the transitions are going to be uh, dependent on a function f. So f is, uh, it can be any function as long as f of zero is zero. And the transitions are the following. So each particle on this lattice is equipped with an exponential clock. And when the clock rings, that particle will jump from site j to site j minus one. So it, it jumps counterclockwise. Uh, with rate f of tau j. So uh, tau j is the number of particles at the site from which the particle is jumping. And so what this means is that the rate of the jump depends exclusively on the number of particles at the site of the jump. And so that's why this process is called uh, the zero range process because uh, the, the rates of the transitions do not depend at all on, uh, on, on any other sites except for the site from which the transition occurs. Uh, and so one of the main reasons why uh, many people are interested in zero range processes is that the stationary distribution is always a product measure. So, what that means is that there exists some function such that we can write the stationary probability of each state as a product uh, over all of its parts. So, so now, uh, so that was the simplest case, uh, which is a single species case, but now we'll describe the multi-species uh, zero range process. So let's fix a partition lambda to describe the types of the particles. So the parts of lambda are going to correspond to the species. And so we'll think of particles with larger labels as being stronger than those with smaller labels. Uh, so multi-species versions of the TASRP have been studied. Uh, so, so, this, so this group of people, Kuniba, Mar Yama Okado uh, have, have, have a, a very large number of, of papers on, on variants of these processes to uh, increasing levels of complexity uh, where you have additional parameters, you can have uh, multiple particles jumping simultaneously. So many, many things can happen um, in the variants that they've studied. So, but, but what's, what's important is that all of these processes 
uh, that have been studied, they're all integrable. And so uh, the version that we described, uh, we, we found that it was actually first studied by uh, Takayama in 2015. Uh, so yeah, so it, it turns out that uh, Takayama describes basically exactly the model that, that, we, that we found to be connected with the modified McDonald. Okay, so, uh, okay, so this, so, so here we have uh, a circular lattice on n sites as before, and we have a partition lambda describing the types. And so each site can have any number of particles. Uh, where the particles of same, the same type are indistinguishable. And so now our states are multi-set compositions uh, of type lambda with n parts. So, so here, if, if we read this, uh, the state uh, clockwise, we get uh, empty, three, two, one, four, two, two, three, one, one. And then, and then our lambda is just uh, the, the set of all types. Okay, and so the transition rates are a little bit complicated to describe. They're a lot easier to, um, to show with an example. So that's what I'll do. So uh, as before, each particle is equipped with an exponential clock. And then the, when the clock rings, the particle will jump counterclockwise. And we have a fixed parameter T. Uh, and now, uh, so, so let's say a particle is jumping from site I and the particle has a uh, label J. So suppose this site has D particles larger than J and C particles equal to J, then uh, the transition rate is, uh, is, is this polynomial in T, so T to the D uh, times the, the T analog of, of C. Okay, so for example, so if we have this state, so if the two wants to jump, there are no particles larger than two, uh, and it's jumping from location one, so the rate is X1 inverse, times t to the one uh, or t to the zero and if if a one wants to jump then uh there is one particle larger than one so that's where the t comes from and there are a total of two ones so we have one plus t as the rate and it's also jumping from location one so we have x1 inverse uh, and then here's another example with the transitions Okay, so so here's so here's a, a quick example for lambda equal to two one one. So these are all of the states in the state space, and so we can write down a transition matrix. So this this matrix is column stochastic, and then we can compute the stationary distribution as the unique left eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue one. And that's, that's what I mean by stationary distribution. Okay, so, so here's the connection to the tableau that I described earlier. So we can read, so let's take a filling. So let's take a tableau sigma. So we can read the state uh, from the bottom row of sigma. So uh, I'll just show by, by example. So, so the bottom row of sigma tells us which location in the uh, on the lattice each particle is located? So, so uh, the column of of length two corresponds to the particle of type two, and so there's a one at the in the bottom row. So that means that uh, the type two particle is in location one. So in particular, that's why each of these cells uh, has a one. And then the, the ones are, there's one in column one and there's one, or sorry, there's one in location one and one in location three. And so uh, the two columns of height one 
uh, both have a one and a three in all of these fillings. Okay, so, um, so, so note that uh, if you recall how we go from these tableau to the queuing system, in fact, it's the same exact map. So, so, the, so the bottom row of this tableau is going to give us the bottom line of the queuing system. And the bottom line of the queuing system is precisely equal to this state. So this, the states, so each, each level of the queuing system is uh, a configuration of the TASRB. Okay, and so uh, the, the theorem is that we can compute the stationary probabilities of a state by summing over all of the fillings whose bottom row uh, corresponds to that state. Uh, and the statistic we use is t to the quin. So, so notice how there's no q in, in, this, um, in this probability. And, and then the corollary, uh, since we already uh, showed that uh, summing over all the tableau gives us the modified McDonald, the corollary is that the partition function of the tesser is a specialization of the modified McDonald at q equal to one. Okay, and here's, here's a small example. So uh, from before, before we computed the stationary distribution for uh, lambda 211 for all of its states. And uh, if we want to compute the probability of the state 21, one, by the way, these are all unnormalized. So the normalization factor is called the partition function. That's just the sum over all of these polynomials. Um, so if we're computing uh, the probability of the state, then these are our, our corresponding tableau whose bottom row uh, corresponds to the state. And we add them up and we get this uh, polynomial which matches with what we want here. Okay, so, so it turns out that, uh, so we can prove that result by constructing an enriched Markov process on the tableau and our Markov process will project to uh, the tesser. So, so for that, uh, uh, let me define some more statistics. So, so first let's take a cell in the tableau. So I define the lower arm to be, uh, well, all of, all of these cells. So the cells to the left in the same row and the cells to the right in the row below, that's the lower arm. And lower arm with respect to the filling is the number of cells in the lower arm that have the same content as the designated cell. So, so let's say that this filling uh, has, has K in, in all of these locations and it has some other uh, content in the other locations. So we count how many Ks are in the lower arm. And so there's three. So that's one of our important statistics. Uh, and so now to define the transitions on the Markov process on Tableau, uh, we're going to allow each cell of the tableau to be equipped with an exponential clock. So each cell on the tableau can trigger a transition uh, as long as uh, the cell it has different content from the cell below it. So south of C uh, means the cell, the cell below C uh, and sigma, sigma of that just means the content of that cell. And so the rate of the, uh, the exponential clock of each cell is just T to uh, the number of cells of the same content in its lower arm time, times uh, X sub the content in risk. Okay, and then we also define uh, the upper arm. So the upper arm of a cell is all the cells to the left in the row above and all the cells to the right in, in the same row. So here, uh, the upper arm contains two cells with the same content. 
And so this, this will become uh, an important statistic later. Okay, and so now a transition of this Markov chain is triggered by cell C as follows. So we're going to take the maximal uh, contiguous increasing chain of cells weekly above C in its column, and we increment them uh, by one. So, so this is easier to see with an example. Uh, so let's say this red cell is our cell C. So we take the maximal set of cells above it that, uh, um, yeah, we, we take the maximal contigu contiguous set of cells uh, that is increasing and we increment each one of those by one. Uh, and so in this case, I didn't mention this, but N equals four here. So when we add one to four, we get, we get one. Okay, and so now uh, the rate of this transition is, as I said before, um, oh, I wrote the rate wrong here. There's not supposed to be a T. So, so the rate is supposed to be T to the lower arm. And the lower arm here is, uh, has zero threes. So it's supposed to be T to the zero times X three inverse. So that's our, our Markov transition. Uh, and so, so every cell in this filling can trigger a transition except for um, this one over here. This one over here cannot, uh, does not have a transition associated to it because it has a one below it. So, uh, so notice that, or, or it, it turns out that when the cell C is in the bottom row, then this rate of, of its transition is going to match the transition rate of the corresponding particle in the tether. So remember that we can associate the bottom row of the tableau to a state of the tether. And so these rates are actually identical. Uh, and just as an aside, when lambda has repeated parts, then we actually need to do a lot more work. So, so this particular marker process only works when uh, each uh, when the parts of lambda are all unique. Okay, and I will very briefly explain how we prove this. So it's a very it's a very simple, as it turns out, combinatorial proof. So let's take a tableau and we define m of sigma to be all of the transitions going out of it. So I, I wrote down all of the rates of those transitions. And then R of sigma is going to be all of the transitions going into it. And here I, I highlighted uh, which, which cells were changed. And so now the balance equation says the following. So, so, so if we want to prove that this is indeed the Markov process that we want, then we need to show that the sum over the probabilities of all of the incoming transitions is equal to the sum over all of the outgoing transitions. Uh, and so we need to show essentially this equation. And in this example, you can see that it's true. So we have the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And so that's what we need to prove here. Uh, for, for this chain. And so here's how we prove it. So this is where the upper arm comes in. Uh, so what this lemma says is that if we take all of the cells of the filling with the same content, then the sum over the upper arms will equal the sum over the, the sum of the lower arms. So, so here's an example. I can compute the, the upper arms in orange and the lower arms in green of, of all of, of this configuration of, of cells. And I get the same polynomials on, uh, on both sides. And so now I, I didn't explain this part, but uh, it turns out that we can define a reverse Markov process. So it's a Markov process where we uh, reverse the arrows in this picture. 
so that's so that's what's meant by a reverse Markov process. And we can define this process in terms of the statistic upper arm. Uh, and then because because this holds, uh, we, we then end up proving the balance equation. And so that, that gives us the stationary distribution. So, so from here, we just want to project, show that this, this uh, Markov chain projects onto the tether. So uh, we make a few simple observations. So if we want the probability of, or the stationary distribution of the bottom row of a two row filling, we just need to sum over all the possible top rows. So by induction, we get the following. So if we want the probability of the bottom row of, of an arbitrary tableau, then we need to sum over all the possible configurations of, uh, of, of the top of all the top rows, except for the bottom one. Uh, and since the bottom row co corresponds to state of the tether, then we get our formula from here. Okay, so some final remarks. Well, uh, it would be great to find an explicit bijection that can translate from the in to the quint statistics. And uh, specifically, we, we know that if two fillings are row equivalent, uh, meaning that their contents, the contents of each of their rows uh, are equal, then we get this equivalence of, of, of the statistics. So there should be a bijection that respects this. Um, and that is all I have. So, so thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Oya, for the nice talk. Um, Okay, so let's see if there are any questions. Uh, I had a quick question. <laughs> Sorry about that. I fixed it. <laughs> Sophie fixed it. <laughs> um, I, before you met, you showed the queuing process thing, and that just kind of reminded me in general of parking functions. It's not the same, of course, because it's because um, it's related to the to the numbers and the fillings that are already there. But I was just wondering if there was a connection there that is either I don't know obvious or not so obvious. Um. I, yeah, I don't know if there's any connection, but whenever I see talks about parking functions, I also have this thought that uh, that they look very similar. Yeah, but I, I don't know of any connection there. Thank you. Sorry, I just realized I was muted. So <laughs> any other questions? <clears throat> All right, if not, uh, let's unmute ourselves and I give applause to, oh yeah, the dance of the talk.